and allow me to introduce our moderator for today, Executive Director of My Brother's Keeper Alliance, Mr. Michael Smith. Michael, you're off mute. Thanks so much, Nicole. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Smith, Executive Director of the My Brother's Keeper Alliance at the Obama Foundation. Uh, welcome to our third MBK Alliance Town Hall on Inspiration and Action During Times of Crisis. Uh, just a quick note before we get started, this is a private call and it is on the record. This call is being recorded. You'll see a little symbol up to the uh, top left of your screen that says recording. Um, we plan to release parts of this conversation on our social channels and on our website at obama.org. Uh, so we kindly ask that you do not record or share this conversation yourself. Today's town hall is all about opportunity youth, the millions of young people living in America that are out of school or work or at risk of being out of school or, or work. Uh, the vast majority of whom happen to be young men of color. Uh, we'll discuss what is needed to ensure they stay in school and on track to educational and economic success while also staying connected to caring adults in the face of COVID-19. You'll hear from Secretary of Education or former Secretary of Education, uh, my colleague John King, former Deputy Director of the National Economic Council, Byron Agist, Chair of the Prudential Foundation, Letha Reddy, and Becoming a Man Boston Executive Director, Sean Brown, and one of his students, Armani Rivas. But before we hear from these dynamic change makers, uh, when the founder of My Brother's Keeper learned we were all coming together, he did not wanna miss out. So it is now my pleasure to kick us off to introduce the 44th president of the United States, Barack Obama. Hey everybody, Michael, it's great to see you. Uh, Nicole, uh, you are just the best MC. You're so cheerful. It made me feel better just listening to you as, as we were waiting. Uh, I see my friend Broderick Johnson there, who clearly, because he's about my age, doesn't know how to work the Zoom as well, so the lighting's a little off. That's okay. We're, uh, us old heads, Broderick, I had somebody help me do this. Um, to all of you that are uh, plugged in across the country, uh, it is wonderful to be with you. Uh, Michelle and I all hope that uh, you are well, healthy, uh, that your families are, are uh, coping under extraordinary circumstances. Uh, and uh, I wanna thank all of you for participating in this town hall uh, and, and this series, which I think reflects our interest in uh, even in this, dire emergency situation, uh, making sure that we stay connected and that we are supporting each other in uh, the really important work that all of you guys are doing. Um, I, I, I wanna start by saying that uh, I could not be prouder of the MBK community and what it's accomplished since uh, we launched it first while I was still president and uh, what we've done since I left office. Uh, across the country, in neighborhoods, cities, uh, you know, organizations, all of you have embraced the mission that uh, this country has to be a land of genuine opportunity for all people, and that too many of our young men historically have been left behind. Uh, and that if we can give them a hand up, if we can give them mentorship and tools and interventions and resources and love and support, uh, that not only can they succeed for themselves, but our communities and our country will be stronger for it. Uh, and you know, when I over the last several years have, have watched and received reports about what you've been able to accomplish in terms of uh, violence prevention, in terms of keeping young uh, men on track when it comes to school, those of you who are working with ex-offenders, those of you who uh, have been translating uh, young people's interests, not just in sports, but also in technology and uh, the arts, uh, into uh, pathways for them to succeed. Uh, the, the degree to which local officials, uh, nonprofits, uh, faith communities, and others have, 
have pulled together uh, in various locations uh, to, to make that commitment. It's been extraordinary. Now, the reason we're here together is because uh, these are not ordinary times. Uh, the world and the nation is going through crisis. Uh, and I came into the presidency during what was then the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Uh, and this is proving to be a worse economic crisis because it combines itself with a health crisis, a health crisis that disproportionately impacts people of low income, people who don't have access to care, and people of color. And so all of you, I think, are asking the question, how do we adapt and adjust to this particular moment? And uh, it's uh, fair to say that, uh, as has been true throughout American history, uh, when crises hit the country at large, uh, you can be certain that it's going to be that much tougher on folks who are already struggling before the crisis hit. Uh, in a lot of communities where you work, you already had high unemployment. You already had high dropout rates. You already had uh, uh, disproportionate rates of violence. And uh, many of our young men already did not have the support networks that they needed. Uh, now you are going to be confronting the same situation, except how you've been doing business uh, is, uh, is not going to be the same. Uh, you, know, you can't convene and bring people together in the same way as right now. Uh, in some cases, uh, financing your operations are going to be more difficult because philanthropies are having to shift resources. Um, schools are closed, which uh, obviously leaves a lot more time for young people to uh, be alone, to be isolated, uh, and uh, potentially to lose uh, some of the learning that they've obtained, as well as having the support networks that they get through the school system. Uh, the good news is that uh, the MBK network uh, is full of innovative, uh, can-do folks uh, who have stepped up to the plate. And you know, what so many of you are doing right now, whether it is taking the work that you've done and shifting it so that you're meeting more immediate needs. Uh, you know, we've been talking to organizations who are saying, we were uh, doing a lot of work uh, around activities for young people. Right now, we're doing a lot of work delivering food to families that are in need. Um, those of you who are uh, shifting uh, the connectivity that you had face to face uh, into online platforms, uh, uh, those of you who are constantly monitoring and checking in and uh, providing feedback and support for uh, the young men who had been involved in your programs, uh, that kind of adaptability, uh, that kind of willingness to step up, uh, it has been extraordinary. And part of the goal of these town halls, I think, is to make sure that, number one, you know you're not alone, that uh, the struggles you're going through are the same ones that folks are going through all across the country. Number two, uh, so that you can learn from each other, uh, because uh, uh, as you innovate uh, and test out and try new things, if something works, uh, the ability of somebody in Detroit to learn from what somebody in Atlanta is doing, to learn from what somebody in Boston is doing, or Chicago, uh, that accelerates our ability to meet uh, the needs that are out there. Um, and I think it's also important for us uh, to reinforce with each other the, just why this work is so important. Um, you know, if if during crises, we don't fill some of these gaps, uh, nobody else is going to. And uh, so many of our uh, young people are already starting off behind. Uh, if 
during the course of this crisis, they fall further behind uh, if they have that much more trouble finishing school, if they have that much more trouble uh, accessing training and getting a foothold into the labor market, if they are that much more likely uh, because of idleness and uh, a lack of uh, attention and support and a sense of purpose that they get shunted into the criminal justice system, uh, it, it's, it's gonna be very hard for them to catch up. Uh, and so we've got to invest that time now uh, and, and do everything we can with what we have uh, to, to fill these gaps as, as best we can. And so, uh, you know, I just wanna say thank you uh, to everybody who's been uh, a keeper of, of brothers and sisters out there. Uh, your tireless efforts every day are making a difference. To all the young men who are on the call, uh, I just want you to know that Michelle and I are thinking about you constantly. You're the reason that we started the Obama Foundation in the first place, uh, because the only way this country lives up to its ideals is if uh, you reach your full potential. Keep your faith and your uh, confidence uh, that uh, if you apply yourself and put in effort, uh, that you can make a difference. Uh, and to all of you who are, uh, you know, running these programs out there, uh, hats off to you. Uh, I, I am confident that we will get through this. And, uh, you know, the Obama Foundation and uh, me and Michelle personally, uh, we're going to be with you every step of the way. So uh, with that, what I want to do is just to Go ahead. I think I've, I've got uh, a little bit of time to listen to uh, a little bit of a conversation between some outstanding uh, uh, brothers, uh, one of whom is a little older and one of whom is a little younger. Uh, they're both younger than me, I'm sure. Uh, in Boston, uh, you know, related to the uh, Becoming a Man program, uh, BAM, which is a school-based uh, group counseling program that I've had a chance to participate in actually sat down with a group of uh, uh, young band participants in uh, at Hyde Park Academy in Chicago. Uh, the, the program in Boston uh, has been uh, going very strong. And uh, you know, my understanding is, is that uh, in Boston alone, they've connected more than 400 of their students per week, uh, hosted more than 100 Zoom groups uh, uh, in band circles so that uh, young men can continue to interact and learn from each other and, and uh, mentor each other uh, and support each other. So uh, I, I wanted to get just a little taste of uh, the great work that's being done from, from uh, the, the folks in Boston. And then I'll, I'll sign off and I know uh, you'll have an opportunity to hear from uh, one of my uh, outstanding uh, Obama administration alumni, uh, a couple of them actually, John King and, uh, uh, and Byron. So. Uh, why don't uh, I kick it back to you, Michael, and you can introduce uh, 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 our, our Boston contingent. Thank you, Mr. President. I know everybody appreciates your words so much. Thanks for your continued leadership at this time. It, it, it really means a lot to all of us. Um, so we get the opportunity, as the president said, to hear from two young leaders um, who are reducing barriers and expanding opportunity in the great city of Boston. Uh, Boston under Mayor Marty Walsh was one of the first cities to accept the My Brother's Keeper Community Challenge back in 2014. Uh, and in 2018 was named a national MBK impact community uh, spearheaded by our friends at the Mass Mentoring Partnership who I know are with us today. Uh, and in 2017, Boston became the first city outside Chicago to operate the acclaimed Becoming a Man program under the leadership of Sean Brown. Uh, the program began with 150 young men at four schools. Today, it has grown to serving more than 550 young men in 10 schools in both Boston and Cambridge. So, Sean, let's kick it off with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about BAM Boston, um, what you do, what your goals are, and how you've shifted uh, your model in light of COVID-19. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Mr. President, um, first and foremost. Um, Michael, yes, uh, Youth Guidance is Becoming a Man program is a school-based counseling program for young men, predominantly young men of color in grades seven through 12. Uh, BAM Boston is the first expansion city um, driven by the impact that Youth Guidance and, and the BAM program has had in Chicago uh, with the support of, of Mayor Walsh in Boston 
in Cambridge Public Schools, we're providing critical counseling services to over uh, 550 young men, um, or as you'll hear me refer to, to them later as scholars across 10 schools in Boston. Um, how we shifted our work um, during this unprecedented times, we've made a, a concerted effort to prioritize three things. Um, what we're gonna do to support our BAM scholars, what are we gonna do to support our schools and community, and what are we gonna do to support our staff, um, emotional health and wellness. Um, how we stay connected to our scholars during this time is, is sticking to our core value of meeting them where they are. Um, you know, and, and first and foremost, just listening to our scholars and reestablishing a safe container. Um, during this time, um, it was important to reestablish that trust and safe space for our scholars um, because we're hearing um, from them, you know, they're, they're scared, they're frustrated, they're angry. Um, so our focus has really been around the, the mental health um, of our scholars and, and, and staff. Um, our counselors are engaging um, with our scholars in brief encounters. Those are one-on-one -on -one conversations um, with our scholars. Um, you spoke about the Zoom group sessions, which are equivalent to our BAM circles. Um, BAM is serving 580 scholars in Boston. Um, and as you said, our target goal is 550. And during COVID-19, we've been able to engage 88% um, of our scholars on a weekly basis. Um, and that speaks to the relationship of our, uh, that our scholars have with, with our BAM counselors um, and the safe space that they, that they create, um, and the safe space that, that BAM creates um, for our scholars. Uh, just real quick, what we're doing to support uh, schools and the community is participating in, in weekly Boston Public Schools equity roundtable meetings, um, sharing that data with the school district and partners in Boston. Um, we're serving as a liaison between the schools um, and, and parents and our scholars. Uh, you know, many scholars are not, don't have the relationship with teachers that they do have with, with band counselors. So being able to be that liaison has been, um, has been crucial during this time. Um, and we also recognize um, that we need to work together more um, now more than ever. So we're convening stakeholders. Um, we're, we're creating calls, we're putting leadership on, on calls with our scholars. And when I say leadership, headmasters, principals, system principals to hear um, from our scholars. You know, it allows us the space just to check in and share our responses to the school closure and um, identify scholars' needs as well. Um, and then in, in, in closing, the last thing around um, what we're doing to support our staff. Um, we understand the importance of that, that the mental health piece plays, not just in our, in our scholars, but also um, in adults. So what we've done to address the emotional and, and health and wellness of our staff is um, in, implement daily health and wellness check-ins. Um, so we check in with our counselors three times, three times a day, um, just to up, get an update on the virtual sessions with our scholars, but most importantly, to support our counselors um, you know, in the process through their experience uh, with, men, you know, what they're dealing with um, from the mental health aspect. Sean, thanks so much. And, you know, on that closing point there, you know, we've heard this time and time again from folks that are doing street outreach work. We oftentimes forget about ourselves. So thanks for modeling that we got to take care of the people that are taking care of the people. Right. Let's go over to a little bit of a younger man to Armani Rivas, uh, who's a participant in Becoming a Man Boston and a junior at the John D. O'Brien School of Mathematics and Science. Uh, and the third year participant of the BAM program. What's up, Armani? How you doing? Good, how you doing today? Doing well, I'm blessed. Thanks for being here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with BAM and how the program has helped you before uh, this pandemic and, and now? Okay, so um, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Michael. Um, Get into BAM, it was kind of, uh, it would happen in high school. Um, my freshman year, I got into BAM. Um, coming from middle school, I came from charter school and it was strict and it had really support in their students. And I know going into a public school, um, just hearing from individuals that I know that public schools don't really have that. So um, I was looking forward to, for a program that replicates um, a past um, program that I was in. And that freshman year, I was, you know, sitting in the cafeteria, um, chilling with my boys, and um, a band counselor was just uh, walking around looking for um, people to be a part of band. Um, I didn't really know about it, um, but he, he gave me his pitch. And from his pitch, I was able to sit in on a circle. And after that, I was all in for it. And um, band before, before I got into BAM, um, I wasn't really, 
you know, I was into a program called Roman and Reed, and Roman and Reed is just basically a mentor program for um, um, men of color in college to young men in middle school. And just having that foundation and being able to have a relationship with someone is something that always intrigued me. Um, so stepping into a, a high school and feeling like it was going to be a little bit off because it wasn't there, but I felt a little bit more relief because, you know, BAM kind of like saved the day. Um, so after being in BAM, the first year, it wasn't something that I, I really like took it serious. I was still getting my feet wet, um, still trying to figure everything out and seeing, just seeing if I'm going to put all my trust and be able to let them challenge me. Um, in my second year, um, it was definitely a turning point for me because we started having serious conversations old because not only was I maturing and not only was I figuring out and understanding these conversations, but it was a point for me to start thinking about what I want to do in life. And um, it was also a rough time for me personally as well. And just having a support system there, it really helped. And from that moment on, it I've been growing and developing as a person. One of the main parts and like moments of being a part of BAM um, who was a part of a college HBCU tour. Um, it was very fun and it, it was something that I knew was going to be eventful and I was looking forward to, forward to looking into colleges and I think the turning point, turning point for me in that moment was just hitting, being hit with that harsh realities of what's to come in the world, which is discrimination, racism, um, economic drought, everything. It's just everything came on um, in which I'm I'm glad it happened because a lot of kids on the trip, they didn't really, they wasn't exposed to it. They're protected by, they're protected by a school system or protected by um, their parents not really being exposed. So just having BAM be there alongside and take us on this journey of discovering ourselves, but also um, facing these harsh realities of the world, it definitely created a turning point for me and made me appreciate BAM more. Armani, that's great. So can you tell us a little bit what, you know, what life is like now with, you know, schools being closed? I think a lot of people think, you know, maybe teenagers are sitting home all day playing video games, but maybe you could tell us a little bit how, how life is for you and, and what your relationship continues to be like during this time with your, with your BAM counselors. Okay. It's um, okay if you're playing video games all the time. You can be honest. <laughs> <laughs> for, the, for the first week, it was it was good. For the first week, you know, it was, it was kind of exciting to not have school off. And it was kind of like everyone was in the unknown. So I was kind of just sitting there and just taking a break for how it was. Um, come week two, week three, you know, it just it started getting real. And the real, real realities to that is being faced with the financial crisis, being faced with responsibilities and knowing that me adapting and um, developing as a young man, I know I started to understand like everything that was behind the scenes from my parents. So um, yeah, I would say the first week it was kind of fun um, being able to play video games, you know, catch up on some Netflix shows. But from the week on, you know, I started, like I said, I started to get a face with harsh realities of, you know, a financial crisis. Um, you know, my parents, our parents, we then went to a grocery store, got a week um, full of grocery stores, a uh, week full of grocery um, items, and we spent it off for three weeks. Um, all my, everybody in the house is laid off. Um, the workload is tough. Um, still trying to continue. And it was kind of a struggle for me emotionally, too. Um, just knowing that I'm able to embrace my emotions, I was... Um, it was hard. It was a hard time for me to not be in school because school was kind of an escape to erase my emotions, and I'm able to face uh, my emotions in these BAM circles, you know. So feeling like I'm, I wasn't having that. Um, it sucked for the first three weeks, and then I had my first BAM check in virtually, and I was delighted. Um, I didn't realize how much I took for granted of these BAM sessions, um, even though I'm so invested. There's, there's still that little part is like, imagine this, it's like we're living in a dystopia, right? And if we're living in this, now that we're faced with this reality, you start to think back and be like, man, I should actually take this more serious. And man, I should probably take at least advice. And man, I should be more invested in my vulnerable, vulnerability and my emotions. 
So I was definitely faced with that as well. So having that band circle virtually definitely delighted me and you know, made me open up to my band counselor more. Um, my band counselor is Mr. Powell. Um, it's, his, it's his second year and the relationship between him, me and him is very great. Um, I definitely look up to him as an older brother. Um, started as a counselor, but he became to he became a brother to me. And just being able to have conversations professionally, academically, and personally, where I could call him if I had to cry, if I could call him to just talk, um, that definitely made me um, appreciate Bam. And that's definitely what I've been doing um, um, to keep myself motivated and keep um, keep up with during this COVID nineteen. Armani, thanks for keeping it real with us, uh, brother. Really, really appreciate that. Um, I wish I had a BAM counselor right about now. You're right. <laughs> Things got real a couple weeks into this. Um, hey, Sean, let me just close out this segment with you. You know, the young people that that we're serving, that you're serving, it's not like the system had treated them well anyway. They were already in underfunded schools, underfunded neighborhoods, um, you know, probably a lot of people didn't have connectivity and all the things that you need to transition. Can you talk a little bit about some of the unique challenges that you're facing and then maybe help people uh, that are thinking about doing distance mentoring now about how you've overcome some of those challenges? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, great, great, great questions, Michael. Um, first, um, in Boston, just like many cities around the country, COVID-19 is having a, dispor um, a dispor disproportionate um, impact on, on communities of color. Which other communities BAM primarily serves? Um, communities like Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, High Park, East Boston. You know, the virus is hitting um, hard in, in, in our communities uh, because people um, in those areas make up a lot of the frontline workers, um, working in the grocery stores, delivering the food, operating public transit, um, which leaves um, them more exposed to the virus. Um, regarding um, our, our young people, um, you know, you heard Armani, you know, Armani's story, you know, we're hearing that young people have to wake up um, every morning having to decide whether I'm going to do my homework or I'm going to support my family. Um, you know, there, there's, you, you said, Michael, there's a misconception that, um, you know, our scholars do have more time um, on their hands. Um, and, and we're hearing the, the complete opposite um, from, you know, from, from, from our scholars. Um, many of our scholars out of necess necessity, uh, because of their parents sick, you know, with the virus um, or being laid off, as Armani said, um, you know, the scholars are having to be parents and, and, and caretakers um, of their siblings, um, the breadwinners in order to feed families, um, amongst other responsibilities. Um, and in addition to, to being a student, um, as well as, um, you know, um, as well as hailing from, from neighborhoods um, where many of our scholars um, come from is incredibly difficult um, in itself. Uh, so dealing with the, the, the mental health piece, um, you, you heard Armani you know, talk about um, the, the pies check-ins is, is crucial. So you know, the, the takeaway you said will be um, you know, one of the pies and everyone can do this. It's just checking in you know, with young people. How are you feeling physically? You know, where are you at intellectually? What are you thinking about emotionally? And what are you connected to um, you know, spiritually? You know, that small thing um, can go a long, a long way. It doesn't only have to be, you know, you don't have to be a, a band counselor to do that. Anyone can have those conversations um, with, 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 with young people um, to, to get that pulse and, and, and check on the, the, the mental health piece. Um, you know, I know it was a long question if I missed another part. If oh, you no, you got it. You got it. That was great. That was great, Sean. Uh, we can all remember pies. Uh, we're probably eating too many of them uh, while we're home. Um, so we'll make sure that we get that resource out to you. Um, I'm actually going to turn it back over to President Obama to make some, uh, some reflections on, on this conversation and some final thoughts before we go to the next part of our discussion. Mr. President? Well, first of all, uh, you know, I think Sean and, and Armani are, are outstanding representatives of uh, both uh, the young people who uh, are involved and benefiting from uh, many of the programs uh, in uh, the MBK network. And, and Sean, I think a great representative of uh, young men, not quite as young as Armani, who are uh, you know, providing guidance and, and, uh, and, and mentoring and, and you know, really uh, doing the work. Uh, in, in communities in need. So uh, appreciate so much you guys sharing, uh, uh, really valuable. Uh, a couple of just 
points that I picked up on. Uh, number one, uh, you know, what Sean said about uh, how a lot of the young people in these communities, they have to think about the challenges their families are facing and the ad added burdens there. Uh, you know, one of the things that everybody in this network should be doing is actively thinking about how we can use our networks to help families, not just the young men, but help families access what's out there. So you know, there may be people who are eligible for the stimulus check that Congress passed, but are not sure about how to get it uh, or you know, don't have a regular bank, which means that they then have to figure out how do I cash this without ending up giving 20% of it to the payday loan, uh, you know, folks. Um, you know, there may be people who uh, are part of a small business, but haven't been able to access some of the billions of dollars that are being sent out uh, for loans. Uh, you know, if they've got a health crisis, you know, what, what's going on there? So part of what I think we can do is to make sure that the, the resources that are available, city, state, and federal, that although you know, we're, we're, we can't necessarily do it for everybody, but we can certainly do it for the families that are in the networks uh, and, and we already have a connection to, and serve as an advocate and uh, ombudsman and liaison to help them access what's out there. Uh, I, I think that could be a, a useful and interesting role uh, that we could play. Obviously, the same is true for the school system. You know, Sean was already talking about how he's talking to principals uh, and talking to teachers. Uh, you know, figuring out how to make sure that whatever resources are available from the schools that the young people are getting those resources. And if, for example, the schools are making an assumption that the young person has access to a computer and they don't, then that's a gap that has to be filled. And you know, it, it may be that the school is just not sufficiently aware of some of these needs and, and, and we can help make them aware. Uh, you know, so the point is, is that, um, you know, for, for a lot of the or MBK organizations, uh, in this stretch where uh, you know, we're not even through the first phase of this crisis, one of the most helpful things we can do is just to get people connected to resources that are already out there and available. But sometimes there's bureaucracy and confusion in terms of uh, uh, how to figure that out. Um, second thought, which is related, is I think every community uh, in which uh, an MBK uh, organization is operating uh, should be pressing authorities and government to start tracking data in those communities uh, because it, it's important for us to know if uh, a city like Boston, let's say, call it 10 to 15 percent African-American, but it's got 50 percent of the COVID cases. That's information that should be made available because that then should help dictate how resources are being allocated in those communities. Um, and, uh, it, you know, I, I think uh, sunlight uh, is the best disinfectant uh, to uh, inequality, uh, and or at least it's the starting point for us to be able to say some folks uh, are, are not being treated the way they need to be, and whether it's health resources, educational resources, what have you. Uh, making sure that uh, coalitions of organizations are uh, seeking transparency in the data uh, about what's happening uh, and getting a good snapshot of where need is. I think that's important. 
Uh, the third point I would make uh, is that, uh, that I, I don't want people to think that this is going to be just a short term thing. Uh, if we're lucky, uh, and in some cases, for example, in Massachusetts, I think the governor uh, and his administration is being more proactive and effective than the federal government is at the moment in terms of thinking about how are we going to test everybody, how are we going to start uh, uh, putting a plan together to slowly reopen. Um, but even in the, the states that are doing it best, even when things reopen, it's still not going to be right at once. Uh, it, it, it's going to take some time. And the economic effects are going to continue to ripple out. Uh, and we haven't we haven't seen uh, I think all the impact that's going to occur. I say that not to scare folks, but to get people thinking this is going to be a marathon and not a sprint. And psychologically, when when Sean, you talk about mental health, part of the goal here is to think about all right, how do I sustain and pace my effort? to recognize that we're not going to get back to what we considered normal for a while. And so we have to build out our programming and our strategies in a way that uh, is sustainable for three months, six months, a year. Uh, again, I, I'm not suggesting everybody's going to be on lockdown for a year, but I am suggesting that we're not going to have everything back to normal. Uh, you know, just simple decisions like, reopening schools uh you know we've got now the summer to work on this but there's not going to be a vaccine available uh and what that means is there's still going to be risks involved in a lot of kids being all together all at once in a school and there are going to be risks for teachers and uh and and you know maintenance staff and etc and, and how schools figure that out it's it's going to be tricky so Thinking long term is going to be important. And then the last thing, and this is to our money. Um, look, A, there's nothing wrong with playing some video games and catching up on some Netflix shows. I've been doing a little bit of that. I, I don't play video games, but I've been watching a couple of shows. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, for example, by the way, I, I don't know if y'all caught the last dance, just a reminder of Michael Jordan and the, the Chicago Bulls. <laughs> my hometown team uh, i strongly recommend that for anybody who's missed it so that you know the goat when you see it but um i i think armani what, what's also important is making sure that uh uh you and your and, and your your fellow scholars and, and your colleagues and your friends take the time now to reflect on the fact that um you know, you are going into a complicated world with a lot of challenges. It was challenging before this, it's going to be more challenging now. And uh, what that means is, is that uh, you have to be really serious about taking charge of your life uh, and using whatever resources you have and whatever time you have and energy you have in maybe a more focused way than uh, some kids who've got more advantages. Uh, and, and that's not fair, but it's the truth. So, um, you know, figuring out, all right, if, I, if I've got downtime, can I ask my counselor to get a set of books for me to read so that during the summer, I can start sharpening my mind and 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 uh, learning on my own, and and learning how to be a self-starter and a self-learner. Um, that is important. Um, you know, if, if if you know right now that um, you know anybody who is not getting some additional secondary education or training after high school 
already was having trouble finding a job. That's even going to be more true after uh, you know we're through this crisis. So, man, I, I got to start being on it in terms of what's going to be my game plan for uh, me, whether it's going to a four-year college, a community college, a training program, whatever that is. I've got, I've got to start focus, uh, get focused now on that and, and figure out where I can get the resources and the support uh, to make that happen. Um, you know, in, in some ways that's, uh, it's not fair, uh, you know, because they're, they're young people who are able to, to slack and, 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 and kind of live off, you know, their parents and they've got connections and they got networks and it's all, kind of taking care of them, uh, taking care of for them for as long as they want um, until they, they find themselves. Um, you know, we're, you are going to have to be on a more accelerated basis uh, in terms of how you, how you handle that. Here's the good news is you've also already had experiences that are making you more resilient, making you tougher, uh, uh, making you uh, more creative, uh, forcing you to, you know, use your mother wit and, and think on the spot in terms of how you handle things. Uh, and, you know, if, if you harness what's already in you, then uh, you will actually be a step ahead, not a step behind. But you're going to have to focus it and you're going to have to, uh, uh, you know, dig deep uh, uh, in terms of effort. So, uh, I, you know, I hope the young people out there who are on on the on the line don't feel discouraged, uh, but embrace the challenge that you are going to be facing, uh, and know that you're going to have a lot of people uh, around you who are not just rooting for you, but are also uh, uh, willing to put in the resources uh, to help you uh, achieve your goals. So. Everybody, uh, I thank you. Couldn't be prouder of you. Uh, stay safe. Uh, you know, take care of your families. Act right. Don't touch your face too much. All that good stuff. All right? Bye-bye. Thanks, Mr. President. So that has been our GOAT, former Chicago resident, uh, Barack Obama. Uh, really great to have his inspiration. We're going to keep going with this conversation. And again, um, we're, we're going to have some of this sliced up and, and ready to be put out later on uh, next week. Um, but we have the experts. We have the folks that are on the front line thinking about what does this mean for schools? What does this mean for jobs? What does this mean for business? So we're gonna jump right in uh, and go into a panel discussion with uh, uh, the Honorable John B. King Jr., the former Secretary uh, of Education under President Obama. Um, and we're probably gonna run uh, until about 15 minutes after the hour. But John, why don't we go ahead and, and, and open up this conversation? Um, I really wanna start with you by asking, you know, the consequences of hundreds of years of systemic racism and injustice are on full display um, as our country responds to COVID-19. And I wonder, what do you think the pandemic um, and the move to school closures in the wake of, of this pandemic have exposed or exacerbated about the racial disparities in school systems um, across the country? Um, and, and what do you think uh, is working? What do you think we need to begin to do about that to address those disparities in this moment? Yeah, well, there's no question that the inequities we're seeing right now are an extension of the inequities that existed pre-COVID-19. Uh, Pre-COVID-19, we were giving the least often to the students who need the most, low-income students and students of color. Pre-COVID-19 had less access to quality early childhood education, less access to well-prepared teachers, less access to resources, less access to counselors, and now all of that is being exacerbated by the crisis. And we see it in the reality that many students don't have devices. Maybe there's a computer in the house, but there are also four kids in the house, and so they can't all learn at the same time. Uh, we see it in the challenge around bandwidth. We have high needs rural communities. We can't get the internet at all. We also have high needs communities where folks could get the internet, but the cable company won't let them have access to the internet because they have uh, unpaid balance. Um, 
we see that school districts that have the least resources are having the hardest time getting their teachers professional development and support to do distance learning well. We see that parents, low income parents are less well positioned to be able to support their kids through distance learning. We know, for example, that for African Americans, 20, only 20% 20 of the African American workforce can work from home. So that means a lot, of, a lot of kids are learning on their own. They don't have the benefit of the coaching and support of their parent. And so they're gonna be behind when they get back to school. And Armani talked about rightly, the huge socio-emotional impact of all of this. This whole experience is traumatic. We also have kids who are in homes where there's addiction, where there's abuse, where there's domestic violence, where there's an economic crisis, and all of that has an impact on kids. Um, so one thing we're gonna have to do is when kids get back to school, we're going to have to respond with more learning time, more access to counselors and mental health services. Some good things real quick that, that we're seeing, uh, districts that are being intentional about making sure every kid is connected with an adult in the school district and making sure that they check in regularly. There's a district in Arizona, the Phoenix Union High School District. They're contacting every kid every day. It's a campaign they have. And when they talk with the kid, they're asking, what do you need? What's getting in the way? Do you need food? Do you need housing? Do you need Wi-Fi? Uh, there are communities that are being creative around the bandwidth issue, including putting hotspots on buses and having the buses parked in different neighborhoods around the community. South Bend, Indiana is doing that to try to make sure everyone can get access to the internet. Uh, there are teachers who are doing a great job staying connected with their students, trying to support their students. There are organizations like BAM and others that are trying to keep kids connected um, to adults, trying to counsel kids about uh, the, the navigating distance learning, but also the transition past high school on to college. So there are a lot of good things going on, but this, this crisis is just putting into sharper relief the inequities that were always there. Thank you, John. Let's, let's go to uh, Letha Reddy, uh, Senior Vice President. I just heard a little uh, echo, but I think that went away. Well, let's go to Letha Reddy, who's Senior Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion, and Impact at Prudential, uh, Chair of the Prudential Foundation, and a member of our Advisory Council, uh, and a former civil rights attorney at the U.S. Department of Education. Um, Letha, Prudential was one of the first supporters of MBK Alliance. This year, Prudential announced an investment of nearly $200 million uh, based on past investments and what your projections are through 2025, specifically around Opportunity Youth. And I'm wondering if you could tell me why a company like Prudential chose to prioritize um, investing in Opportunity Youth. And I'm wondering if you could talk about some bright spots that you're seeing in your portfolio uh, on how um, some organizations are, are responding right now. Letha? Sure. Thank you, Michael. So, uh, you know, Prudential is actually founded, uh, our mission is to solve financial challenges. And so uh, our founding premise was to include those who have been excluded from financial services, primarily working families. And like working families, opportunity youth are facing often, right, structural barriers, structural inequities, and John spoke to this. Uh, and so, that we know leads to financial fragility for themselves, for their families, for their communities. So we see from a mission orientation uh, and from a values and purpose perspective, a role for us to play in helping to address the needs of opportunity youth. So we come at it from both a moral and a business imperative. And I think in terms of what we're seeing, certainly in our headquarters and hometown of New York, and I think this is playing out in other communities across the country, uh, is right the fierce determination of our nonprofit sector and other actors in local communities who are really stepping up to meet the needs of the challenge. And some of the things that they're doing are some of the things that people talked about. The president talked about helping people, young people, access benefits that they're eligible for. So the Opportunity Youth Network in Newark and the Alliance for Children's Rights in Los Angeles and other groups, right, are doing just that, helping young people access unemployment benefits and the stimulus checks if they're eligible for that. We are seeing people make sure that young people feel stable, right? And so whether it's the check-ins that uh, Bam talked about or whether it's um, having other students reach out to other students to help them feel connected. So that connectivity in a time when so many young people are feeling so isolated. 
So those are just a few examples where we're seeing people really, you know, make some moves that are helping to solve the needs, the very pressing needs in this moment. Awesome. Thank you for that, Letha. And thank you for mentioning uh, Prudential's headquarters of Newark. I'm sure we've got MBK Newark um, on the line. So hello to MBK Newark. Uh, Byron, let's go to you. By Byron Agist is the CEO and co-founder of Opportunity Work that is looking to retool uh, the U.S. economy in, in favor of, of our opportunity youth. Um, and as I mentioned before, he was the deputy director of the National Economic Council. Byron, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about um, why this pandemic will have a greater impact on opportunity youth. Um, and, you know, as uh, Winston Churchill said and Rahm Emanuel uh, quoted later, uh, how do we make sure we don't let a good crisis go to waste and that we use this moment to our advantage to make sure our opportunity youth uh, end up even stronger economically on the other side? Byron? Right. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. So I guess I'd emphasize um, uh, three things. First of all, that... Um, Yes, in both the scale of the crisis, the economic crisis, and the, the where it's hitting hardest, it is absolutely true that this is a major negative event for a lot of people, but definitely concentrated in communities of color. The second thing I want to emphasize is that there are actually tremendous hidden strengths. And as it turns out, we Opportunity Work had just done a piece of work that really kind of called those out. So I want to, I want to name those because... Um, this is what we have to rebuild from. And so, and then finally, I want to say we're at a fork of the road. So in other words, what happens now is not entirely, it's not just the physics, it's what's up to us. So let's talk about the first, the, the impact of this thing. So if you're keeping track, the last four weeks, 26 million Americans have filed for unemployment. Um, to, to give you a sense of the scale of that, um, that's, that's more than twice the number of, of sort of net job loss in the Great Recession. Um, it's out of 160 million people, you know, so it's, it, it's, it's a big part and that's in four weeks. Um, and, uh, so that is, there's no way to sugarcoat that. That is, that is a tremendous amount of damage and, and even against the backdrop of sort of, you know, some, 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 some cash infusions, um, there's going to be a lot of hardship. There's going to be, and, and people are, are, are very displaced and it isn't over as president Obama said, it's not a, is this, this isn't a kind of an 18 day miracle cure. It's not, but it's also not a, an 18 year, you know, drought, it's prob but it's probably an 18 month kind of like major event. So I think that's a, that's a fair kind of planning scenario for what disruption. Um, and of course, I mean, the, both the health effects and then the job effects, I mean, in the, you know, there's probably people making under $40,000 a year north of 80% of the jobs that are most at risk in this are, are in those categories. And for those who have jobs, many of those jobs um, are uh, right now have a higher level of, of sort of health risk and, and, and danger. And thus far, we're only starting to see places really take that seriously enough and, and to sort of protect uh, people. Um, so, so you've got that problem. On the other hand, um, I just wanna say the, so we did some work um, uh, opportunity work with, with Accenture and others in a panel of sort of top people looking at, people talk about people in low-wage jobs a lot as sort of having low skill and you need more skills and everything. And of course, we all need to be learning all the time. But what you see is actually a bunch of low-wage jobs aren't actually low-skilled jobs. And in fact, the people in them are not low-skilled people. And we know this, and I, I know it from my family's experience or life experience, but you know, you, you, you know what everyone can point to people they know, right, who really have it together, but they're in this low, and, they, and the, the actual what it takes to, to actually do the job they do, and to, by the way, manage all the finances and all of these like different shifts and everything, it's like a complicated set of equations. People run those traps all the time. And we actually looked at the entire labor force and looked at the skills required for all the jobs and all the from twos to, and to boil it down, we looked at sort of 70 million people of whom three or 4 million were opportunity youth that have high school degrees, don't have college degrees, but are skilled through alternative routes. They're stars skilled through alternative routes. They have um, lots of skills learned on the job. They might've learned them in training programs and on-ramp programs. And they're a huge talent pool at 71 million people. And just as a punchline of those 71 million people, as of the moment the pandemic hit, uh, 5 million of them were already in high wage jobs that people said, right, oh, you wouldn't hire right, someone without a degree into. 
That's like jobs paying more than twice the medium income. The 5 million have worked through all these traps, even though nothing is sort of, you know, there's all these barriers, but they'd gotten there and you could see the pathways they took. And then there was another 30 million who today had the skills for jobs that paid at least 50% more than the job they were in. I'm not saying who need training for that or no more training than anyone would need, right? Going to a new job, you need, you know, your company always trains you, right? On their processes, et cetera, 30 million. And then there's another 36 million who would need more than that. But that's a lot of people. And I just want to say that is a really important fact to keep in mind because as you talk about how the, what the impact is going to be, it's not just the immediate impact. It's what do we do about it? What do we do about it now? And what do we do about it to rebuild? And so we are facing a fork in the road. We have real choices. On the policy side, we have choices about whether we're really going to invest behind people and their human capital, which would be making sure that wages can be maintained and to make sure that if you lost your job or if, you're, um, or if you can be kept on the job, you're act people, that we're actually investing in building your skills, not just for the work that needs doing now, but in six months, 12 months, 18 months, and beyond. Because we have a work is solving problems, and we're going to have a heck of a lot of problems to solve coming out of this. There's a lot of work to do. And if you think about some of that work even today, um, once we get our act together, as I believe we ultimately will, in sort of dealing with this, uh, the coronavirus, uh, an enormous part of that is contact tracing. That is to say, when someone, has, when someone is known to have a case, who do they interact with? Let those people know. Basically, every country that has managed this effectively has done that. Well, you know what? We probably need a million contact tracers. So who among us has a bachelor's degree in contact tracing? No one does, right? And what does that activity entail, right? It, 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 it's actually a combination of uh, a, a bit of organization, using a bit of data, and then uh, actually knowing communities where the cases are and being able to sort of counsel and help people change behavior. But that is not a job for which the people with, you know, a lot of selected degrees are necessarily advantaged. But what, what, when I say we face a choice, if we decide that, well, okay, there's a bunch of people with degrees out of a job, so obviously we'll give them the jobs first, right? That is a mistake. And we don't need to do it that way. So I think one of the things we really need to think hard about is that this disruption is way too big to solve it by doing the same old, same old, right? Or the, a system that said, we're going to judge you by your history, your pedigree, your past, was already a system that could not adapt fast enough for the, the world we were in. And it certainly cannot adapt fast enough for this. So we need ways, and, and that's a lot of what we work on with partners for uh, people to be able to show what they can do and like get a job, get moving. And I think there's just so, there's so much possibility and we can talk later about what happens over the horizon kind of 18 months out. But, but I think there, uh, there's a tremendous amount of talent. There's a tremendous amount of need. And as we get the public health issues under control, I see absolutely no reason why opportunity youth, why, why stars, skilled through alternative routes like of all ages should not be part of that solution. In fact, there's a lot of reasons why they should be. Phenomenal. Thank you so much for that point of view, Byron. It, it's so important for us to think about the future that we can build together um, and, and instead of thinking about basing everything solely on the past. Um, so as I said a little earlier, we're going to go to 515 East Coast time. So we're going to go for about 15 minutes. So uh, for those of you that are uh, in our panelist view, uh, get your questions ready. Um, I'm just going to ask a closing question to, to John and Latha. Um, so John, last week we had Dr. Bob Ross on the call and he said he had the doctor's prescription for what boys and young men of color um, are going to need uh, to make through this crisis. So I'm wondering, perhaps you have the uh, uh, Secretary of Education syllabus uh, that you could give us. What is it needed? You've got mayors on the line, you've got business leaders on the line, philanthropy leaders on the line. What's needed policy priorities, programmatic priorities, the most important things you think uh, to not only change the, the game for today, uh, but making sure that we come up with a stronger educational system for our kids on the other side? Yeah, well, for one thing, we need resources. I'm really worried about the impact of this economic crisis on state revenues and the risk that we'll see very big cuts to school funding, to after school programs, to mentoring programs. Uh, to summer jobs programs. Uh, so we're going to need re resources. We're going to have to commit as a society to invest resources in our young people. 
two, we're going to have to do everything we can to minimize the loss to learning during this period. And so we've got to make sure that we put pressure on those cable companies to waive the unpaid balances so folks can get on the internet. We got to make sure that we provide professional development to teachers so that they can support their kids through distance learning. We're going to make sure that every high school senior finishes the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, so that they have the money to go on to college. We've got to make sure that we minimize summer melt, the problem of high school seniors who say they're going to go on to college in the spring, but then never end up on a campus in September. Uh, that means we've got to stay in touch with students. We've got to make sure colleges stay connected to students, that students complete all the registration forms and register for courses so they can make the transition to college. We need higher ed institutions to step up and provide bridge programs for students who've missed a lot of school. Uh, we already have a remediation problem on college campuses, but think about the student who's going to take the placement test for math and they haven't had math class since February. Now that's a student who's very likely to end up at a remedial course that's going to set them back financially and make it harder for them to graduate. So we've really got to say, what would it take for every institution at every level, federal, state, local government, higher ed institutions, school districts, to say we're going to protect our most vulnerable students, we're going to get them the resources and support they need to make sure that they can succeed, whether it's in high school or college or in a career development program. Uh, that mindset shift uh, may be one of the, the few hopeful things to come out of what's been a disastrous moment for the country. If we come out more committed to turn to each other rather than on each other, more willing uh, to support um, our fellow Americans to get access to opportunity, that, that, that would be an important good thing. Phenomenal, John. Thanks. And that's what My Brother's Keeper is all about, helping our neighbor's child, uh, making it the neighbor's child as important as our own. Um, so I'm going to ask Le Letha a, a closing question and then MBK communities uh, who are in the chat box, get your questions ready. You can start asking them now and Nicole is going to facilitate some questions. Um, but Letha, we know that uh, corporate social responsibility and philanthropy cannot supplant government, right? Um, we know that's not possible. It's a drop in the bucket. Um, but it has always played such a crucial role um, in supporting the, the work of the social sector on a day-to-day -day basis, but also in times of crisis. Uh, and I'm wondering, what do you think is the key role um, for, for philanthropy and business philanthropy uh, in this time to really change the game for our young people? So I'll speak to uh, corporate philanthropy, right? Because that's what I know best, it's what we do. And to us, it's, I mean, in the best of times, but particularly now, when even uh, in the corporate setting, right, we're suffering from the market volatility and our resources are, you know, challenged at the moment as well. For businesses to really focus on their core capabilities, right? What do we know best? What do we do best? And what are the levers that we can pull? The full set of, right, what does our entire business platform look like? And what's the opportunity set for us? So for Prudential, right, we know financial services. We know what it takes to be financially secure and to be resilient. And so, and we know newer, right? We know what it means to be based and rooted in a place. And so those are the things we're focusing on. Uh, so I think it's, you know, it's really about then how do you bring all of that to solve the challenge? And, you know, I'd say one thing businesses can do and, and many are stepping up in this regard is we're large employers, right? And so how do we maintain in this moment our employment commitments? whether it's for interns who are coming in, right, in the summer, everybody's looking at their programs, uh, whether it's for the opportunity youth who are interning with us right now, right, how do we support them, how do we continue to employ them, pay them, and all of that. So they're just, you know, again, that's core to who we are. It's an easy thing to do, um, but there are other things like that that businesses should look at. Letha, thanks for saying that, uh, and I, I appreciate you leading that conversation. Let's make sure that we continue to take care of our young people this summer, um, even if it's remote. Uh, and I know we've seen some businesses that have stepped up. We've seen some cities that have stepped up. I know it's hard in the face of, of budget shortfalls, um, but we know the vast importance to summer jobs, uh, to long-term employment. And we also know the importance of summer jobs to violence prevention. Um, so thank you for, for, for making that point. I am now gonna turn it over to my colleague, Nicole Fields, who got the greatest shout out from President Obama today uh, to moderate the Q&A for the next several minutes. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, so please remember to drop your questions in the chat box. If you're on our panel list, you can drop 
questions um, as we're going through these Q&A. So the first question is from Alana Felderman Soler in Puerto Rico. She says that the Opportunity Youth in her community don't seem concerned about the virus. They continue social activities as usual, which means our staff continue mediating conflicts as usual. Any suggestions on how to engage them with prevention? Um, that can go to BAM or any of our panelists. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll suggest one thing, which is I know that Arnie Duncan, who was my predecessor as secretary, he has a program that's focused on reducing violence in Chicago. And so he has uh, youth workers who are out in the community trying to reduce uh, gun violence in particular in Chicago. And now he's pivoted to training the outreach workers through CRED to not just do violence prevention, but to do public health work. And so they are also now in a position to, to try to coach folks on the public health concerns. And they're trying to be a force that encourages people to take physical distancing seriously, to, to wear masks when they're outside. Um, all the things that we know are gonna be critical to protect our most vulnerable community from the impact of COVID-19. I, I, I think that's a great example. And it, it really, it, it's, we're in a very low trust environment in this country, right? I mean, people aren't trusting what they're hearing from the White House podium. They're not trusting what they're seeing on TV. And so it's, it's, it's pretty easy. And, 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 you know, in communities of color, there's like more than a few reasons not to necessarily trust everything authorities have been telling you. So um, I, I think there is a superpower of organizations like the ones in the NBK network that you have built over time the trust and earned the trust. Of, of communities because uh, the I think the only way we're going to get through this because the guidance is going to change over time right and, and so and it's and it's and it's a kind of an enemy you can't see right so trust is required so I believe that uh, these entities have a very important role in in kind of in, in getting that message out but I also believe that that is work right like guidance coaching right? Like all the way to what I was describing with contact tracing, that is work. So I believe it's from a policy standpoint, that should be supported. And, you know, the next wave of recovery dollars, a lot of them should be th flowing through cities and should be flowing through organizations like the ones on this call to do that work, to do it safely, because they're going to need to invest in, in all of that too. But, but I, I think we should stop seeing uh, sort of relationships as a, as a sort of a side topic. Those are like powerful assets relationships, trust, and the ability to do a reality check that someone will listen to is kind of a superpower in the environment we're in right now. And so we need to invest behind that from a policy standpoint, but the organizations on this call should feel the, should absolutely not feel helpless because what you offer is absolutely essential, particularly when we look at the statistics of where the incidence of COVID-19 is, in which communities. So it's, I, I can't underscore enough how important it is you think of this not just as a problem but as a something that is waiting for you to solve it and i hope we all step up to support you as much as as as, as you deserve awesome thank you panelists our next question is from jerome russell of atlanta he says we received a three million grant $3 million grant to seed the Herman J. Russell Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship to promote Black economic mobility and entrepreneurship. The data shows that the wealth gap will continue to widen and projects that young African-American males will have the highest rate of job displacement due to this current crisis and automation. How much emphasis should we put on teaching entrepreneurship as a new way forward to combat this displacement? And I guess we could take that to Byron or anyone on the panel. Well, I'll just say, um, I mentioned that there were 5 million stars, right, who don't have college degrees that who are already in high wage jobs, right? A, a, a very high proportion of them took an entrepreneurship route because they found the doors, you know, sort of not fully open to them within a lot of institutional structures. And, that, and that's the way they, they got there. So I, I do think entrepreneurship is a very important part of it. And I think capitalizing like access to capital, access to mentorship and so forth for entrepreneurs is very important. That said, um, I, th I, I, I don't believe the narrative that says, oh, technology, automation, therefore we're all gonna lose our jobs. Technology is not gravity, 
okay? Technology is a tool and the way we use it matters. And in fact, most of the big trends in artificial intelligence, if you look at them, they really aren't whole jobs, they're parts of jobs. It, artificial intelligence kind of wants to augment people. It wants to sort of like imagine that you have 80% of the skills for a job, but an AI can have the other 20% and complement you and, and help you learn along the way. There's all sorts of ways to deploy technology that is investing behind people and their progress. The question is, what do we choose? What is the goal? What are the priorities we set as a society through through policy and, and through our actions? So I, 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 automation is a very important topic, but I think the way we should enter that topic is how do we deploy technology in support of human goals, right? And therefore, I think you got to think about not just technology, but also democracy as, 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 as an interaction in terms of how that acts in the economy. Awesome, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Leon Andrews at National League of Cities. And, it's, and Leon says, really appreciate President Obama acknowledging the need to look at disaggregated data and using data to drive decisions. In the past few weeks, the data has shown that what we already know, disproportionate number of people of color, particularly black communities, are dying and are in, affected uh, in many other ways. Does anyone have suggestions on how decision makers should target resources and strategies to people of color that are most affected? Well, well unfortunately, what we're seeing is really an extension of pre-existing health disparities, and we, we need significant uh, systemic change to address those. There are some immediate things. There are some states that still haven't expanded access to Medicaid, and so uh, people do not have health care that should. Uh, there are folks who are doing jobs, whether it's working in a grocery store or working on public transit, who aren't being provided by their employers with masks, gloves, the kind of protective equipment they need to keep themselves safe. And we know that disproportionately affects uh, low-income folks and communities of color. Um, we know that, that how the healthcare institutions that serve high needs communities are often the ones that get the least resources. And so we really need an infusion of resources to the hospitals, clinics, health facilities in communities of color so that they're in a position to treat, to test early, treat people early, um, and address this. But, but we, in the long run, we have to emerge from this crisis with a renewed commitment to address the health disparities that are reflected in everything from the fact that uh, black women are many more times as likely to die in childbirth as white women to the disparities around diabetes as a result of food inequities. This is a larger systemic problem, but there are some immediate actions that can be taken. I think the highest single impact thing, the highest single impact change you can make in policy in the short term is to channel recovery dollars directly to cities and counties, not just to states. Some should go to states, of course, but right now we have in many states, we have a lot of situations where an enormous amount of our population and, uh, and low income population um, are uh, in cities or sometimes in rural counties uh, that they, where they don't have any political power within the state. And it's, it's absolutely not automatic that if you send resources to the state that they're gonna get to those areas. And it's particularly not the case that it will get to those areas in a way that actually is responsive to the needs of those communities, right? So those, I, I think cities and counties are not perfect, but if you had more dollars to cities, I guarantee some of those cities would want to be using those dollars, would want to channel them through organizations that they know that they know have, have deep roots in the community and can actually do this work. So I would say if there's one thing to fight for macro, it's that the next recovery has, a, has money to cities and counties too, not just to states. Awesome, thank you. Um, and since we are running out of time, this is my final question to all of our panelists. Um, if you could give us one call to action that you would suggest to all on this call today, all of our attendees, um, what do you want them to know and do after hearing today's conversation? One call, call to action. Um, I'll start with you, uh, John King. Sure. Well, we know e even in the school districts that do distance learning well, uh, students are going to have lost ground when they come back. 
uh, to school in the fall. And so we've got to do everything possible to address that learning loss. We're going to need summer school, distance summer school this summer, likely, uh, an extended school year, summer programming and summer 21. We're going to need after school programs. We're going to potentially need Saturday school, vacation school. Uh, we're going to need a lot of investment in academic supports. And we're going to have to have intensive tutoring for students. We have to figure out where kids are when they get back and then focus intensive energy on the students who are most behind so that they can catch up. But we have to take seriously our responsibility to prevent a lost generation of learners. Excellent. Sean, let's go to you. One call to action. And Armani, you can jump in too. Team, we've got Sean on mute. There you go, Sean. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Awesome, awesome. Um, my call to action, um, involve young people in the design process. Uh, Armani and our scholars hear me say this all the time. They're the, they're the experts of their own experiences. You know, let them help guide the interventions we develop. Um, young people should just not be the beneficiaries of our program. Um, they should be with us at the table uh, to inform, adapt, and, and, and evaluate them. So that would be my call to action. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, let's jump to you, Byron. Well, I couldn't agree with Sean more, and I would, I would build on that by saying organizations like yours should, should know your strengths, know your superpowers, and don't underestimate what you have to bring to the table. I'm very close to a school in Washington, D.C. called Monument Academy. It's a middle school that serves families that have, whose lives have been strongly disrupted, and the school has already provided services for families. So that is a school that already knows the families right? Day one, they were with the families. They're in touch with every family every day. And they actually, so in, in a sense, they've been dealing with this kind of chaos and disruption, right, throughout. And so they're actually better adapted in a way um, than, than many other schools would be. And there are people, I've met so many people that uh, think of themselves as you, uh, well, that have been told their whole lives they're unique. They're one in a million, right? Some of the stars we've met. And one of them said to me, you know what? here's what I know. Um, I'm not one in a million. I am one of millions. There is a tremendous amount of talent, of power, and the superpower of knowing what you know, and having a check on reality, which a lot of people who've lived easier lives are behind the curve in their reality checks in this situation. So just, I would say, you know, get out there, and hopefully we will try to support you, but what the work you do is more essential than ever uh, in this situation. Awesome. And finally, Letha. I would say uh, the economic crisis that is resulting from the health crisis puts business in a real opportunity to lead on some of these issues. So my call to action would be to my business colleagues to say, let's help define the better America that we want to see. One where there's a true safety net, where there's better access to post-secondary education, better workforce development, right? All these things that will benefit our opportunities and so many others. Thank you. And I forgot Armani, please, Armani, jump in. All right, thank you. It's all, it's all good. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was like, um, you know, we talked about the coronavirus and then we're also identifying like the systematic issues that lasted before um, COVID-19. Um, so something I really want to focus on and, and just like, I it all together, especially from my story, that we must contact and we must create relationships with the youth. Um, and we must be able to have a mental health and well-being check-in um, from individ individual to individual. And it doesn't have to be teacher to student. It doesn't have to be, you know, your title against a younger person. Um, just being able to check in with an individual for being an individual, um, that holds a lot. Sure. Awesome. Thank you. Kicking back to you, Michael, to close us out. Hey, thanks, family. Thank you for being here um, for our communities. Thank you for continuing this fight, not skipping a beat. You know, I think when this crisis came up, no one would have blamed any of you if you would have said, you know, I need to go home and take care of my kids, my family. Um, but almost everybody to a person said, I got to continue to take care of my neighbor's kids, of my community. And so the president said it on behalf of him, on behalf of Broderick and our advisory council, I just wanna thank all of you for the tremendous work that you're doing. I wanna thank our young kings 
and Queens um, for continuing to hold down the fort, not waiting to be the leaders of tomorrow, but leading today. You inspire us every day. Uh, and we've got your backs. Um, so we're going to continue this work. We're going to continue from MBK Alliance figuring out how to support you. Um, be on the lookout for our next and maybe final town hall. Um, I'll sneak peek. It's going to be about youth and law enforcement next week in partnership with Cities United um, and featuring Attorney General Eric Holder. Uh, so you're the first to know it. Uh, we'll be getting those invites out uh, on Monday morning. Thanks for all you do. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, stay safe. Be blessed. Bye-bye.